Anyway, let's move on. So I am delighted that I've got the, uh, the fabulous Joseph Kim who's going to come and talk to us. Uh, for those of you who don't know, obviously, uh, well, Joseph is at Lila Games, but also has, does a lot of work with the Deconstructor of Fun folks. Um, and we've got with us as well a whole, well, we've got Nick and Asfar who's going to join us as well. So Joseph, how are you doing? Hey. Oh, so not see Joseph. He's coming, I'm sure. Hello. Hey, there we go. How are we doing, man? Doing all right. Good stuff. Right. So in that case, I will hand over to you and uh, let you introduce your panel. All right. Great. Hey, welcome, everybody. Welcome to Pocket Gamer Connects Digital Number 7. I am Joe Kim, your moderator for this panel, uh, CEO of Leela Games, and also making a new free-to-play shooter game out of India. If anyone is interested, feel free to reach out to me. And also author of gamemakers.substack.com newsletter. Anyway, today we are speaking about tools and techniques for game economy analysis. Definitely, in my opinion, an area that should get a lot more attention and can oftentimes be the difference between success and failure for many free-to-play games. On our panel today, we have three great speakers. So I thought we could first start with Afsar Ahmad. Afsar, could you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about Gameberry Labs? Absolutely. Hi, guys. Uh, uh, I'm Afsar Ahmad, and I'm co-founder of Gameberry Labs. Uh, we make board games. Uh, dice-based board games, uh, and specifically we are known for Ludo Star and Purchasey Star. Both these games have a combined daily active user base of 6 million, uh, and these games are mostly played around South America, Saudi Arabia, all the Middle Eastern countries, and India as, as well. Great. And next we have Alvaro Gilabad, a Business Development Director for TikTok. Alvaro, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? That is correct. Um, I am Alvaro. I'm directing the west and north of Europe for Pango, the audience network uh, powered by TikTok uh, ads. And we are one of the strongest networks in APAC. We're also working at the moment in Russia and the Middle East and very soon coming out to many other markets. So watch out. Great. And finally, we have Nick Murray, the head of games for Carry First. Hey, I'm Nick. Um... As Joe said, I'm head of games for Carry First, which is the biggest publisher focused on the African market. Um, so working with both developers and publishers to find additional sources of revenue on the continent with our own payment platform, etc. cetera. Um, I'm also a consultant uh, alongside that, working on mostly products, live ops, monetization, and fun things like game economy, which we're gonna talk about. Great. So. Maybe we could just dive right in. And I thought we could first open with this question about how do you sort of, what are common techniques to model an initial game economy? So before the game is live, you've got a specific type of game and you, you have a feeling about how the economy should work, but could you guys speak to how you would approach the, this initial modeling before the live data and maybe starting with you, Afsar? Yeah. A lot of time, it depends on the game genre as well. Uh, specifically, if I talk about board games genre, uh, Ludo, Parcheesi, and in these games, they have a very high dependency on a on a very softer currency to to exchange between people. So, so it completely depends on a game genre. And then, in particularly, if, if I talk about, we have attempted a lot of games, and when we start building our game economy. One of the things that we actually study thoroughly is going through each of the games in that particular genre, what the other games are doing as such as a company and what they're trying to create in terms of an experience. And then we would try to replicate it through our scripts, probability, and try to mix it up and try to understand, okay, what is exactly that, that you can expect when players are actually playing your game. So I would say more or less it is dependent on understanding the competitors and specifically running through scripts at the beginning. From our end. Okay. Uh, Nick? So yeah, as, as Afsar mentioned, like a good starting point for this is to consider your competitors in the market, like who's doing this really well. Um, as the previous speaker actually alluded to as well, it's not a good idea to necessarily just copy one for one, um, but rather use it as a starting point, um, knowing that if you go 500% away from that starting point, you might end up in trouble. Um, I think understanding the depth of your economy is really, really key for, for any game genre that you're going to work with. So a lot of games start with the intention of saying, okay, we're going to monetize through IAPs, but then maybe the game design doesn't actually give players enough to spend on. 
Um, so in those cases, just sanity checking your game design first is a really, really crucial step. Thinking about how different levels of spend over different time periods would impact the game that they're playing. So compare a player who spends $1 a month to a player who spends $200 a month and think about how that's going to affect like the gameplay, how that's going to actually influence the experience of these players. Is there enough for them to keep this interesting? Um, I still have from, I think it's from about five years ago, there's a kind of Kotaku article that's stuck in my head about uh, a AAA PC console game that started dabbling in IAPs and the writer purchased $100 of currency and there wasn't $100 worth of stuff to buy in the game. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of tales like that where clearly there is a mismatch between how an economy is designed and the depth that it can actually offer. Um, okay. I mean, I can talk for hours on like things like RPGs and casual and puzzle games and how to differentiate, but I think the main points would be always consider player progression. Um, so for a game like an RPG, like consider how you want a player power curve to look over time and then actually try and retrofit your economy so that you are ensuring that players are regularly going to be feeling progress. Um, if you know that you're going to be introducing, I don't know, new heroes in a Marvel game or something like that, then it's important for players to not feel like, okay, this is yet another uh, goal a million miles away from me. I should always feel like I'm close or on the route, on the way to actually achieving goals by leveling up my power overall. Um, and then, yeah, in like puzzle games and stuff, it's more about, I think, making sure that there's like nothing kind of hard blocking your progress through difficulty balancing and then taking into account estimated failure rates as well as like the price of currencies and power-ups to overcome those obstacles. Always, as I said, making sure that there is a route for players to not get stuck um, because it's a very quick way for players to leave and find another game that was easier. Got it. And um, before we jump over to Al Alvaro, there was a question that was kind of coming in about, you know, tracking sources and sync specifically, but maybe we, I can ask a follow-up question in terms of like when you are doing this initial modeling of the game economy, what are specific things that you would model, whether it's, you know, RPU curve or the, you know, the monetization depth and how you would do that. But um, so I'll come back and ask you, uh, Afsar and, and Nick about that, but Alvaro kind of going to you and given your background is, as far as, you know, where, where you come from and having greater depth on the ad side, wondering if you could answer the same question, but also give us some additional depth with respect to, you know, how would you model or balance an economy based upon ads as well as IP? Mm -hmm. To be honest, I kind of agree with both Abzar and Nick. I think, you know, especially for brand new indie developers, it's good to have a reference. It's good to do some market research and understand which kind of category your game fits in, what other people have done, where the mistakes have been, and, and kind of try to learn from those already. Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, it's not a huge uh, and a very old industry, but there's still a lot of stuff that is being done already. So I think it's good that brand new indie developers learn from from the experience that other people had, because there's been already some uh, good success and failure cases. So it's good that people know already what's happened. Um, and I do agree a lot with Nick that there is a lot to do with depth uh, in terms of where the user can go and how far they can go. He obviously has taken it into the NAP purchases path, but there's also a lot of users who might be appealed to your game and they might not have, you know, their resources, the economical resources to go that far either, but they still want to play the game. So I think it's also good to have a backup plan and design uh, another path for these users to still make you money without spending their actual money in the real world uh, and still go further because it might not be as much as, you know, in terms of in-app purchases, my, maybe it's a 10, maybe it's a 20, a 30% of those users that actually could potentially make you money. And they, you know, again, talking about retention, if you don't design a path for these users, they will eventually realize that the game is not made for them. So they will just leave the game and you might be missing out all this money that you could potentially 
be making with that uh, versus in our purchases. So I think it will be it could be good to you know have from the very start um, a backup design where you could target these users that maybe I don't know because of the willingness or maybe because of their actual money power they can't go further in the game without ads and you need that and you want to keep them because at the end of the day you know it's users that they do like your game in most of the cases our users that come into your game organically they like the idea they like the concept um and it's users that you could potentially have as loyal users just if you have the right way to keep them in so i i agree with nick that it's good to have um you know a really good path for users that could actually spend the money in. But I also think that it could be good to not, um, you know, leave behind all those users, even if it's just a small percentage of users that could potentially also make you a, a good amount of revenue uh, if you had the right path for them. Um, also, I must say, those users, even if they can't make the money, because they usually stay in the game because it's usually a, a highly engaged game, uh, the engagement is paid very well by advertisers. You can make probably as much money on ads, but, um, as, as much as you can make on a purchase with the users that can actually spend the money uh, right. in the game. So I don't think it's it's um, good to underestimate the value of these users. And I think it could be good to take them into account from the very start of the game design. Right. And Alvaro, for maybe some of the folks in the audience who are kind of sitting behind their their spreadsheet model and about to like you know try to model this out like what are like what are some of the key things that you would try to model whether it's you know a, a retention model against a projected arp dow you know sort of number of you know views and contribution in terms of rewarded versus interstitial versus like what are some of the things that you would put into a model to design you know sort of how, how it would monetize in, in the economy so um, I think you have mentioned some of the factors already. So uh, the yeah. formats are definitely something that you need to test and consider. Uh, not all the games uh, need all the formats. Not all the games uh, are suitable for all the formats. The actual um, placements, the place where you, the place where you put the ads. In, I mean, as it's uh, called, is very important. Uh, you need to know exactly where to put and you don't have to disrupt the user. Even if it's a user that knows that will have to face the ads because they won't pay for it for the game, you try to make the ads as organic as possible to make sure that you make it comfortable for the user to face them. Um, you also need to make sure that you reward in the case of a reward, the user as much or as little as possible. Yeah. Both ways, you know, it's dangerous if you put too much value or too little value. If you put too little value, obviously the user won't continue watching the ads. But if you put too much value, then the speed of the user going through the, the user flow of the game will go too fast and then the retention could get damaged. So it's very important to test as well how much value you give to the ad, not just how many ads. Um, but I think it's a balance between the ad frequency and the value of the ads uh, or, or how much you think the, the ads are valued in the game. Again, this is a trial and error thing. You need to keep testing and making sure that your game adjusts as much as possible, uh, considering things like uh, the LTV and obviously the, the retention of the user. Okay. And now Afsar and Nick kind of going back to the follow-up question. So whether it's like a sources and sinks model based upon progression or you know, checking for economic depth or kind of the your, your model for average wallet size of, of pairs or things like that, could you speak to like in this initial model, what are some of the things that you would look at or some of the things that you guys would want to model? Sure, so I think the first place that I start when I'm thinking about any like economy design is time. Um, like players time is the most valuable resource they have even more so than their money at this point, at least. Um, and it really needs to be like a significant part of how you plan your economy. Um, it's one of the reasons I talk about progression so much because I feel like when a player spends time, they need to feel like that time is being rewarded at regular intervals and that manifests itself as progression. Um, the way that I would show this, particularly within sources and sinks, and like 
I think the question was around kind of how to understand how to balance these. Um, basically, on a live game, one of the things that I like to try and pull is data for um, like cumulative kind of soft currency um, by player level or by time versus the sinks and the total, like actually how big those sinks can be. Um, it's a very good and quick way of just showing um, like if a player has either got far too much currency for a given point in game or nowhere near enough. Like there will be an interplay between the two, ideally. There will be levels where a player will level up and on their level up, they don't have enough to unlock the next thing. That's great, that's perfect. But they shouldn't also be at zero of 10,000. They should be maybe at 5,000 of 10,000 so that they have this encouragement and this goal in front of them. Um, so I think the way that to really focus on sources and sinks is just to do that, is to really think about what is the like the income going to be? What are the sinks available to the player? Um, and it's something that can be very easily optimized um, after launch as well. Um, the only other thing I would mention as well is if you do it after launch, preferably get the modal uh, number for this. So look at where most of your players are at. Uh, averages can be misleading in this case. Okay. One of the techniques, Joseph, that I have uh, found it really useful is mm -hmm. trying to convert your currencies or your currencies especially in, in a very simplified manner. So let's say even if you have a hard currency, you have, let's say, five types of currency or items in the game and you want to balance the, these items or currencies together. Uh, a good easier way to do that would be trying to convert them into a form which is not interchangeable in terms of players can do it, but it kind of helps you in, in thinking in terms of uh, expenditure. For example, time, like Nick mentioned, mentioned time. So your hard currency, you can convert them as a time and your soft currencies also, you can start to convert, treat them as a time. And your time will be the single unit that will be used across your game. And you try to, whenever you're going to try to see the balance, you see what is happening with, with that particular master currency, I would say. And it will be a little bit difficult to balance it out. But if you have a master currency approach, it kind of helps a lot uh, in, in doing a lot of things here and there. Okay, great. And maybe before we move on to the next question, Alvaro, I, I know one of the, in speaking to Afsar's uh, comment about exchange, I, I thought we could actually also talk about kind of this common problem when we talk about IEP based games versus ad based games and in games that are heavily IEP monetized. And when you, when we, when you also introduce ads from an economy perspective, when you think about the value exchange between your, you know, your, let's say rewarded video ad to hard currency, like how do you think about that? Or how would you model that to ensure that you are optimizing your, your overall, you know, LTV or revenue? I think there's ways nowadays to target uh, paying to non-paying users. Obviously, it's hard to guess and to assess the percentage and the amount, amount of users that are not going to be paying for your game uh, before the launch of the game. But I think it, it will be safe to have a path for these users that are not keen or can't actually pay for, for you know, the features in the game uh, to have a path. I think, that's, I think that's the key point, having somehow a, a side way uh, on a second path for these users to to find a way to move forward in the game um there's no bad users or good users obviously there's the more they pay the better but not everyone can pay it's, it's real life no everyone has the, it's the same power of purchase so um i think it's it's kind of bad to underestimate users that can't just you know give the credit, uh, you know, the credit card details and just make a purchase. I think there's ways, there's a lot of resources at the moment uh, to still make a lot of money, especially when it comes to RPG games, you can make as much as, mon as much money as you can make on a direct purchase through ads. You don't have to expose paying users to ads. Uh, that's also something that I, I need to make, make clear. There's ways to make sure that you only trigger the ads to the users that can't afford it. Uh, and I'm sure that these users 
over 50% of these users, there's been studies about this, uh, are not going to be offended if you show them an app because they are aware of it. They know that somehow they have to support the, the game and they need to uh, show ways of uh, appreciation. Let's put it that way. So um, as long as you have the ways in a very, again, non-intrusive way, uh, the user will appreciate it and they will move forward. And as, as a matter of fact, I can tell you the ACPMs that you can get uh, of an ad shown to a user in a game that is mostly in a purchases base is as high as the actual value that a, a whale can pay in the game. Okay. And maybe now moving on to, let's say a game is live and we're trying to check the health of the overall game economy. And wondering if you guys could speak to then, what does that look like from a monitoring analytics dashboarding perspective? Like what are the key things that you'd be looking for to check on the health of your economy? What does that look like? And maybe starting with you, Afsar? Yeah. So in terms of looking at economy, so let's say, uh, I generally prefer median over averages, like Nick said. Uh, and apart from the median, I, I look deeply into 90th percentile and 99th percentile because that's the real loyal players that you have in the game. So you have to look at them and try to understand what is going on in their lifespan rather than just looking at the median, median numbers as such. So 99th and 90th percentile is kind of pretty tricky. And then you'll see a lot of things happening over there, which will bother you rather than looking at median as such. So I really like that particular number, especially. Okay, Nick? So, I mean, you've got all your standard KPIs of, you know, retention, monetization, et cetera, which are still critical, right? Like they can still give an indication of the health of your economy as well. Like a poorly retaining game can be a result of the economy. Um, and likewise with monetization. Um, so the things that I would add to that, though, would be looking at things like graphs of player level or progress over time. Um, so where a level isn't relevant, use some kind of proxy like player power um, and generally look out in those for where they plateau. So if a player is stuck at the same point for too long. Um, aside from that, like if you are doing the sinks and sources thing, make sure to track currency gain on level up. So like what currency a player has on their level up and then what new sinks are introduced as we mentioned earlier. Um, if you are also looking to run live ops and do kind of quite often item sales and that kind of thing, then item balances and saturation reports are also a useful thing to have. And I mean, I, I don't think I need to be on everything. Um, I think it's largely a question of common sense, right? If you know your gacha is an integral part of the meta game, then make sure to track the currency that's going into it and the value coming out of it. Um, and then think about how does that change by player type? How does it change by day of activity for that player on day zero versus day 60? Um, so it's really just about thinking through the problems and thinking through the systems that are integral to your game and just trying to understand all right, what's going into that system? What's coming out of it? Does that look about reasonable? And most of the time, honestly, you're playing your game enough uh, as a designer or as a product manager working on it that you should already have a gut feeling about the things that aren't quite right. Okay. And Alvaro? I cannot be more uh, in line with Nick. I think he's pretty much it. <laughs> I mean... If you work close with your uh, game design team, your product team, you should know already beforehand, you know, from the tech, tech tests to the soft launch, what could potentially be the flaws of the game. So I think at that stage, you already should, you know, maybe make a pause and understand where you could potentially fix things. Uh, but I don't think I can add that more to what Nick just said. I think it's, it's a matter of understanding your product understanding the, the specific you know, environment of this particular game, understanding what could potentially go wrong and trying to find a fix before it ha it, it, it's a problem. You need to be you know, upfront. You need to be two steps before the user faces the problem. Just make sure that the user does not face it 
uh, testing, uh, trying things, playing. I think that's it, to be honest. Okay. And maybe I could just throw open this question to, to anyone who wants to answer, but I thought another good question to ask is more from an organizational workflow perspective, right? And so like you have a live operating game and in terms of who's watching the economy and how does that workflow work? Is there you know, the interplay between whether it's a PM to a producer, to a systems designer, to the CEO for a smaller company, like how does this generally, or how would you guys recommend that the economy be monitored and then actions taken to actually execute an optimization against the economy? And just throwing it open to anyone who wants to jump in on this question. I, I can take it up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, to start with, in our case, uh, I think product managers and game designers both are kind of constantly monitoring. Uh, from an organization point of view, I think a, a lot of times people don't either don't have visibility uh, in terms of, let's say, these kind of dashboards, or they are just not driven towards checking it out. So I think that is more critical piece where you, you make sure that the team is driven towards checking it out on a daily basis, whether it is making any changes or not. It is, it is important that it becomes, the baseline becomes inside your head and you know absolutely in and out that this is the baseline that we are going. And especially in our case, uh, what we have is, is 11 pages of KPI metrics that are, are we ask everybody to track on a daily basis that you should go one by one first thing in the morning so that you know what is happening in the game on a day to day basis and, and a lot of times we discover cheats hacks just from these metrics and we know exactly what is happening in the game the moment we see a dip or a spike in those graphs any other comments yeah so i mean i i think the responsibility piece is a really big thing like i mentioned um, and it is a collaborative effort Right, so everybody who is involved in these different features, and the producer, product manager, um, and expanding to roles like customer support and community as well, um, everybody should be capable of highlighting in their department where they have identified that there could be an issue. Maybe a player has mentioned it. Maybe an analyst happens to have come across something. Uh, but ideally, uh, again, you have the tracking in place and everybody on the same page and make it someone's responsibility have somebody be the person who reports on economy and how the economy health is on ideally at least a weekly basis um yeah that's pretty much it okay and then i i thought we could also talk about let's say you know in, in terms of the type of analysis that's done once a problem is identified so let's say revenue drops or we're seeing um, you know vip dow drop or just uh, kind of wallet turnover you know kind of you know decrease or increase like how what what happens from there are, are there are there any specific types of analysis or techniques that you guys would recommend to like look Look at uh, look at a problem that somebody discovers and try to address those problems. And I'll yeah, throwing it open to to anybody here. I mean, quite often when you have identified a problem, um, there are a lot of theories swirling around as to what that could be, and it's just a question mm -hmm. of basically like a detective, if you're feeling romantic about it, going right. like one by one through the list. And I think one of the main places to start if it's a problem with spending, which quite often it is because that's, that tends to be the first place you see it. Retention tends to be a bit more of a stable metric. Um, you would look at something like, what are, your, what are your spenders up to? Like, how do your spend buckets evolve over time? What did that group of players spend last month compared to this month or last week compared to this week? Have there been any game changes in between? Um, what are the live ops events looking like? Maybe they've been too generous. Um, backing that up again with things like saturation reports. Um, I remember at one company I worked at, we took over a game and uh, that game had been performing extremely well. So the company I was working for bought it. And before they bought it, that company basically had a fire sale. Um, and the economy was pretty nuked by the time we got there. So everybody just had stacks and stacks of 
resources and spend instantly dropped. It took a while to understand exactly what had happened because we didn't have all the data, but these things are, are very easy to find if you are tracking saturation over time, if you're keeping an eye on your spend buckets. Mm. Okay. I think that's true, yeah. I think it's all about user experience and also, but there's all the factors that should be included. You should know where the drop is, not just about the user in terms of uh, an average, but also the country. There's a lot of seasonality going on. It could be Christmas in the US or it could be Chinese New Year, you know, in February. You need to understand that maybe the drop happens because there was actually a peak the month before or the weeks before. You need to see the whole background around the user and why the drop happened. It's not just an average. Again, you need to you need to go beyond and understand the demographics and uh, the background of the user that ha might have experienced this drop. So, it's not always blaming the game. Sometimes it could be the game, but there's always some other, you know, actual cultural and geographical factors to be included in this drop. So, yeah, it's good to have a a, a wide open view on what's going on. Right. And one of the questions that did come in did ask about tools. And so that, that's essentially this next question, which I wanted to ask you about. And so whether it's, you know, I, I know a lot of people work inside of an Excel spreadsheet, but as far as other tools, whether it's, you know, building Python models or using kind of external third party tools like machinations, wondering if you guys could speak to what, what do you guys use? And are you guys seeing anything new out there as far as tools and using these tools for different types of analysis. We start with you, Afsar. What, what do you guys use? Yeah. So uh, in our case, I, we most of the time we are uh, making use of the spreadsheet itself, but mm -hmm. I specifically want to talk about uh, one particular game, which, which was uh, pretty interesting for us because, uh, because I've, I, in my past, I've worked in some of the games, which had a lot of narrative inside it, a lot of conflict going on and, everything was interlinked between each other. So while doing that particular game, I had a very first-hand experience of dealing with a huge amount of conflict together. And, and it becomes a nightmare to edit that conflict to test out. It is nightmare for PM, it is nightmare for QA and producer, every single guy in the team, right? Uh, and especially for developers because they feel that the bug is in the code, but it's sometime in the conflict. So, uh, so, at the beginning, what we did before getting into a lot of complex things, we just started building the tool first because we knew that, okay, even if we are testing this game to a small bit, we need to have a basic tool, which will be more like a web website for our internal usage, where we'll just create configs and interlink the config between each other. And that particular tool was such a bliss for us because we were able to do a lot of error checking right at the beginning of downloading those configs. Uh, we were able to run script on these script uh, on these configs very easily and try to get how the game's economy has changed as a player. Let's say if you're assuming the player journey, how the journey of the player has, has changed. So that was one of the like extremely remarkable experience for us because we, we built that tool right from the very beginning. It was basic HTML website with on Node.js and then that's what we were trying to do. It's pretty easy to build. And I think if you can build something like that at the beginning of your game, you should definitely do that. Great. Yeah. Nick Other Carl, than that, it's just a spreadsheet. Other than that, it's just a spreadsheet for us right now. Yeah, I think um, most of my experience is, is largely in Excel these days. Um, like I have tried out a couple of third party tools, but I feel like so, quite often, they can be too generic when you have something very specific and when your mechanics need to be the way that you have designed them. Um, so generally Excel provides the most flexibility and also a way to kind of workshop different configurations and things like A-B tests, at least just to plan them. Um, and then ideally for like, I think the visualization side of things that we mentioned earlier, which is pretty critical in understanding where your economy is going, um, preferably I use Tableau um, for like the actual kind of graph and dashboard creation. Mm -hmm. um, in an ideal world, hooked up to your own SQL database. I know that's not possible for everybody. Um, and I'm sure there are some decent third-party options in between, which I'm not 
going to comment on because I don't know which is best. So. Okay. And I think we've got about three more minutes left. So maybe I could just end with a final question before opening it up to Q&A, which is, is for our audience, if you guys could name like some of the more common problems or mistakes that you have found as far as game economy modeling or the optimization of a game economy, it'd be great to hear from you guys what you guys think. Uh, and again, maybe starting, actually, why don't we start with you, Alvaro? I think um, back to obviously my field of expertise, the main problem is this big myth that there is among, especially mid-core game developers that uh, adding ads to your game, it kills the game. Uh, adding ads the wrong way kills the game. That is the actual truth. Uh, but if you are smart and you know how to place the games, that is, that is definitely um, a good way to, to deal with every side of your game economy. Um, planning ahead of every possibility. You know, the game might work really well, even just within app purchases at the very beginning. Uh, but at some point of the maturity of the game, at the sunset of the game, you might still need, if you want to still squeeze as much as possible the game economy, you might need that. Be prepared for it. I think that's the key. Be, be ready for it. Uh, know where you can have a backup plan and, and be prepared for every option. Uh, that's, that's it. And testing, testing is key. Testing, testing, testing as much as possible. Okay, Nick? Yeah, so actually on, on the ads point, um, one thing that I do with uh, every company I work with is check the, like, the actual, the value of the ads um, for the company and the value of the ads for the player. Very often, um, if you translate the value of what you're giving away to dollars and compare against the actual money you're going to receive for that ad, you're probably quite a long way off. I have seen ads that give away up to like $2 worth of value um, in hard currency, when in reality, you're going to be receiving a fraction of that. Um, so that kind of thing really has an impact on undermining your IAPs. And I think that's exactly what Alvaro is talking to about incorrect implementation. Um, so apart from that, um, another thing to always check as an easy one is make sure your pricing structure is correct in your key markets. Um, so when you go to buy a bundle of gems or whatever, like the more expensive bundles should give more hard currency per dollar or per euro or whatever currency you're looking at like it's very straightforward but very often there are one or two values that seem wrong so you know you might be actually giving worse value in your 100 euro price point than your 50 euro one and that makes zero sense there are occasionally people obviously doing price anchoring experiments and that's fine but most games don't really attempt it there so it's just a good sanity check okay i'm sorry yeah I think one one thing as a game designer, a lot of mis time we do a mistake is, is being too taut, too too tight in terms of our economy. Uh, I think we should remember to create a roller coaster ride for the players. So sometimes give them some of the currencies loosely so that they, they feel that experience of being on top of the roller coaster, coaster ride. And then suddenly when, when they have experienced that, they would feel a little slowness and then, then suddenly you give them again a boost of things. So I would say you should try to create that roller coaster ride with your economy and try to be more, not be too taught about it that, okay, this is going to affect the whole, whole thing. Try and experiment and test it out. Okay. All right, guys. So I think we're going to shift over to Q and A. If you have any questions, feel free to put them into the, I, I guess there's a Q and A chat. But, um, yeah, there's do... a Q&A button there, so uh, lots of stuff we can talk through, lots of questions being asked. Uh, I was going to chuck, a, chuck something in, um, something a uh, design asset works for me, Glenn, uh, talks about the, the Thanos fallacy, as he describes it. Um, people attempting to balance everything perfectly, um, which we think is a mistake in itself. In particular, I'm a massive fan of uh, the book by Dan Airely, um, um yeah, it's predictable, uh, sorry, predictably rational. Yeah, that's a great, great book. There's a section in there about hot dog economics. Uh, you know, the idea that you get six hot dogs, you get, uh, sorry, eight hot dogs, six buns, 
that deliberate imbalance is that something that you guys look at doing when you're looking at building the economy of your, your game? Are you are you only looking for balance or are you actually looking to try and chuck in a bit of imbalance in the process? I'd be interested to know what you think about that. I feel like it's easier to start with just looking for balance, actually. Um, like I think imbalance is a great thing, as you mentioned, and Afsar mentioned it as well, having this kind of more roller coaster effect um, is a great thing. And it's not like okay, this new sink costs me 50 gems. I have 49. I need one more gem and then I'm going to level up and I'm going to have one more gem than I need. That's not interesting. Like there needs to be this push and pull against the game. Um, but I think that can be done through kind of more straightforward balancing and then adding the more kind of irrational or the like the more unpredictable side of things, I think is makes for great A-B testing actually. Um, it's really like the time to experiment and try out these kind of things because like there are some behaviors that humans have which uh, as as mentioned in that book are seem absolutely crazy on the outside mm, like the absolutely. whole field of behavioral economics around it um, but uh, it's best to test a few and find out which one works best because the one you have in mind might not be the one that works for other people right now yeah, maybe sense. Oh, yeah. sorry i was just going to say oscar what one advantage of imbalance is the ability to actually help balance your economy in case something goes awry, right? And so that's why like gotchas always have dual input currencies, right? Because if you go too far, you can all you can tighten one relative to the other, for example. So but you can no, also use live ops for that actually. Um, so you, you, like sorry, I was just gonna say you can also use live ops for that. Mm -hmm. um, so live ops is a great way of balancing your economy if you think it's a little bit broken in different areas of the game. Um, particularly if you think about like the gap between big spenders and small, then maybe you actually develop events which are appealing for big spenders, but actually push the smaller spenders up further in rankings as well, give them a few more rewards. So there's a lot you can do with live ops after the fact. Yeah, the thing I was going to add there was that really just thinking about it as a journey rather than a simple kind of um, uh, seesaw. And I think it was it you have talked about that earlier. I, th I think that to me is really the crux of when I'm looking at a game is I'm looking for like anchor currencies, which I mean the things that I have to play to get that I don't necessarily, can, you know, I can't necessarily buy. I can't sort of ignore the game and just get all the currencies. And I find that sort of thinking of, of the flow of the player as important as the balance itself. I, I do get where you're coming from. We've had this conversation, I'm sure, multiple times. Uh, and Nick did an amazing masterclass uh, for us uh, a little while ago. Um, but moving forward to that, in terms of that system-like thinking though, I mean, that interesting, particularly as far as Alvaro, I'd be interested to know what you think in terms of like some of these system thinking tools. I mean, we've seen things like loopy and machinations. Are they useful or is actually basically, let's just stick with spreadsheets and, Trello's and data coming from a raw source. Does any of that appeal? I think, I think machination. Ha I think there's yeah, no need to do things. Can do, can do. I don't think there's there's lots of you know scenarios that you need to build up. I just think it's more of a trial and error. Um, as long as you're quick enough to spot the problem, that you should be fine. It's a matter of keeping the user seen. At the end of the day, the retention is key. So. Um, I don't think you have to be imagining every single possible scenario of a problem before the game is going into the market. It's more about preparing for the worst case scenario or the few worst possible case scenarios and be ready for those. Yeah, it, it is a scary thing. I think uh, there, there are so many things. I remember the number of mistakes I've made designing economies. I worked on a first person shooter location game with blockchain. You can imagine the different elements you have to hit. But my problem was I tried to consolidate every possible element of the journey. Complete mistake. Um, and if I, I did actually try to use machinations, but again, I spent so much time trying to learn how to use it that I didn't actually balance the game. So, so Asai, what you were going to say something there as well, weren't you? Yeah, I was saying uh, like it's, it's pretty useful in terms of machination. The, a lot of game designers have started using it because some of people, some of the people, no matter what you do, people are scared of uh, learning new things. Like in general, especially if you talk about script, a lot of game designers are not comfortable learning scripts and building complex systems out of it. And I think machination works really well over there. I think it's something 
worth spending time on, I feel. Yeah, I mean, I think finding as a, as a designer, finding a good source of you know, insight of what other people do for balance, I find very difficult. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to Brenda Romero's book, which hopefully comes out later this year, because at least there'll be something on the topic that I can feel that I'm not just making it up as I go along. Uh, do, what do you guys do to sort of give yourself like um, insight or kind of views or help you question your own approaches to balancing the games? I mean, it'd be interesting to see, I mean, Nick, you've done a lot of talks on this subject. What yeah, you, I mean, or inspiration. I think generally just other people like talk to other game designers, ask them about the games that they've played recently that have felt good. Um, mm. Like, mm. I think the feeling of a game is very much kind of correlated with how the economy works. And a lot of the time, just someone saying to me, oh, yeah, I checked out this game the other day. I thought it was really good, like can help inspire how you define, for example, the beginning of the funnel like how the tutorial works, like how currencies are distributed there, how currencies are introduced there as well. Um, there is actually a, a game and economy designer of another company who reached out to me the other day on LinkedIn, just asking me a specific question about like a new game economy. And we had a chat about it and, you know, gaming is a collaborative industry. So like, I think talking to other people is your best bet. Anyone else want to pick up on that? Joe, do you have any? Well, I mean, you talk to so many people on your podcasts and yeah. your various, uh, you know, documents you produce, and obviously making these games. I mean, what's what's the thing that's influencing your thinking in terms of balance and design and economy? I mean, I, I think the for for me, I mean, it's just really understanding the the systems well, right, and then trying to have a strong hypothesis around what are the variables that are going to drive the system and then what are the expected you know uh, what, are, what are the expected outputs from the system and then you know I, I think when when you're first modeling that behavior I, I think that's a hard part that, but then once you go live I, I think the for, for me it's like tying the model to the specific outputs that you expect and impact to the game. And then trying to then, you know, whether it's through, you know, root cause analysis or other types of analysis, try to determine how to optimize the, the system and the, and the model that you have against that system. And that makes sense. That makes sense. Alvaro, do you have any, any thoughts on that? What, what's inspiring you and driving your thinking? I do think that we're very lucky. The gaming industry is a very friendly one. I think it's good to talk to other peers to understand where the problems have been already in similar cases. I think experience is the key here. So if you've got someone that you can talk to that have been, you know, facing similar situations with similar games, it's it's a very good start point. Uh, other than that, obviously, any market research or your own testing experience are the best solutions that you can have for a start, 100%. Any last comment, Asfa? No, okay. Uh, so, I mean, there is one last question. I know I'm running over time, but I think this is such a good one, and particularly because I mentioned blockchain earlier and that has all sorts of problems. I don't, this, is, this question isn't about blockchain, but it has a related connection. Namely, what do you think about marketplaces that trade game currencies? Is that a positive for us as making games or is it the worst nightmare for a game designer? Anyone who wants to just, I mean, just give me a quick answer, you know, yeah, great or disaster, Nick? As I think someone said about piracy the other day, it's neither good nor bad, it's a bit of both. And it's probably not as bad as you think. <laughs> oh, that's fair, that's fair. Joe? Potential for disaster, especially with bots. So be careful, yes. that's all I'm saying. <laughs> exactly, Alvaro? <laughs> Um, I'm just going to stick to what Nick just said. There's no right or wrong. It's just the way it's done. If it's not messy, I think it could be a very interesting challenge. So, I don't Exactly. Know. And, and as far, do you agree with us or do you think it's a disaster? Yeah, if, if you can stay away from bots, I think you can manage a lot of things. You, you can see a lot of interesting things happening if you can just stay away from bots. That sounds good. Yeah, stay away from bots and uh, gold farms. That was the thing that used to get us back in the day. Um, anyway, enough said. Guys, that was amazing. Really appreciate you. I and mean, this is one of the uh, the areas that I, I've been doing for years and I always feel like a rank amateur. I always feel like a beginner every time I start it. 
uh, I, I don't do too bad, but uh, I, I, the more we have conversations like this, the better it be for all of us, I'm sure. Thank you very much, guys. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Bye. And Joe, th thanks very much for hosting. That would be awesome.